Welcome to the Red-Haired Archaeologist. I am your host, author, and sunscreen advocate, Amanda Hope Haley. Thank you for spending some time with me, studying artifacts our first century Near Eastern ancestors left behind, and considering if those items just might change how we read or read into scripture. If you've been following along with the episodes of season two, then you know that I've been taking us on sort of a counterclockwise tour of the nation of Israel, stopping in different locations that have artifacts that maybe you've heard of before, maybe you haven't. Last week was a big, popular, famous one. We were in Masada, and that is where Herod the Great built his Winter Palace complex. So this week, we're not going to go too terribly far. If you had just visited Masada and you were in your car, you would just head due north with the Dead Sea immediately on your right. And off to the left, you'd have the plain areas and directly behind them, those cliffs. They're limestone cliffs that are a lot like the ones that Masada was built on top of. Well, after about 40, 45 minutes, you look over to the right and you might see that the low plain area is dotted with a few buildings. And maybe you could even make out places where some of those old buildings have been restored slightly, certainly excavated. And then back behind them are high cliffs with lots of crevices. And as you get closer, you can even see that there are some caves in there. So this area is called Qumran. Probably heard of it. Qumran was in ancient times the place where a sect of very private Jews, probably the Essenes, lived. They lived a monastic type lifestyle and they wrote, they created, they copied, and they made the Dead Sea Scrolls. So I thought to share the story of Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, it sort of break today up into three separate stories. Let's start in 1947 with when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. So it's 1947. It's a couple of years before the state of Israel is actually founded. And there's a Bedouin tribe that is moving in the area. Bedouins are, of course, nomadic in nature. They don't have permanent homes. They live in tents. And they go wherever is good for their sheep or their goats or whatever their herds are. So one day, a goat herd is out and he leaves his flock to, well, this is how the story goes anyway. Goat herd is out there and he leaves his flock to go try and find one that sort of got away. The story goes that this was a young Bedouin. So he approaches the cliffs and starts to kind of climb up there. And he goes to one that will later come to be known as Cave 4. And it's very, very dark in there. And for all he knows, that there could be people living in there. There could be animals in there, you know, waiting to attack him. You know, he doesn't know. So he picks up a pebble and he tosses it into the cave, expecting to hear an echo or maybe the rumblings of an animal, something like that. But instead, he hears the breaking of pottery. It's like, oh, well, that's different. That's interesting. He pauses a minute and then he cautiously goes inside. And what he finds are a collection of clay jars, somewhat sizable, maybe, you know, tall enough up to say his knee. Not little oil lamp fillers or anything like that, but really, you know, sizable containers. And he peeks in some of them. A lot of them are empty. A lot of them are broken. But seven specifically are intact. And he looks and he sees that, oh, they're just old scrolls. Some of them seem to be blackened on the top. He doesn't really know what they are. So he leaves. Not sure if he found his animal or not, (laughs) but he goes back to Bedouin Brothers and tells them about the find. And so a couple of others accompany him up there. And so they get in there and they take a sampling of what they find and go to Bethlehem where they happen to know an antiquities dealer. And they show these to the antiquities dealer. And the antiquities dealer maybe isn't really sure about them, but he thinks, yeah, there's some value here. And he's like, "Okay, guys, why don't you go back, see what else you can find, bring me some more and we'll talk. And so the Bedouins go back. They get some more, come to the antiquities dealer. And ultimately, the antiquities dealer, this first guy in Bethlehem, buys four of the scrolls from them, and there are three remaining. And so they go to another antiquities dealer in Bethlehem, and that guy buys the other three. The first dealer, who has four scrolls, immediately turns around and resells them. He sells them to a man, he's named Archbishop Samuel. He is the head of the Syrian Orthodox Monastery of St. Mark in Jerusalem. The archbishop hangs on to him for a little while. We'll catch up back up with him in a second. The second dealer who had three 
ended up getting in contact with the father of Yigal Yadin. You may remember we referred to him the last time. He was one of, if not the first major archaeologist to work at Masada. Yadin's father is at the time a professor at Hebrew University. He hears through the grapevine about these mysterious scrolls that have been found and that are sitting in the hands of antiquities dealers. And so he works through some channels and crosses over actually into the Palestinian area of Jerusalem, which could have been incredibly dangerous, and looks through a screen at the scrolls. He immediately recognizes that these are biblical texts. As the story goes, he is the first person to recognize the value of these beyond just their age and they were scrolls, but recognizing how important they could potentially be because of their content. I'm going to pause here and really explain why these were so incredibly important, because what he is seeing is another copy of some passages from the Hebrew Bible, because he can only see just a fragment of it at the time. Well, I mean, what's the big deal, right? Like... I mean, we today, I'd say most households, especially in America, probably have multiple copies of the Bible, multiple translations on their shelves. Like, okay, this is another version of the Bible. Who cares? Well, he can tell by looking at them how old they are. And up until this point, the oldest versions of the Hebrew Bible, there were two of them. They're roughly the same age. The first one's called the Aleppo Codex. It was dated to 920 CE. And the second one is the Leningrad Codex, which is dated to 1008 BC. Those two documents together make up what we call the Masoretic Text. And so in 1947, the oldest complete copy of the Hebrew Bible, which of course in the Christian Bible we refer to as the Old Testament, although some of the books are in a slightly different order, but same books of the Bible. In 1947, the Masoretic Text is the oldest Hebrew version. It is dated to a thousand years after Jesus was born. For a document that is so old, that's almost even a little bit embarrassing. You know, why weren't there older versions of such a sacred text that hadn't survived? One thing that we did have was something called the Septuagint. That is a Greek translation of the Bible. A lot of times, maybe if you're looking at your translation, you'll see a footnote somewhere and you'll go to the bottom of the page and it'll say something like LXX translates this particular word a different way. LXX is the abbreviation for the Septuagint. That Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible is complete and it dates to parts of it date to 300 BCE. But even the first complete version of that isn't around until 400 CE. But that is a translation. As we know, a lot can be lost in translation. There's a reason that that's a catchphrase, that that's an adage. So there has always been this desire for an older, complete version of the Hebrew Bible. And Gadin's father, that day in 1947, peering through a screen at these old documents, realizes that may be exactly what I'm looking at. So the professor acquires those three scrolls and he publishes them in just a simple way. One of those three scrolls happens to be a complete version of the book of Isaiah. That's in 1948. Shortly after that, Israel declares itself a nation. Political tensions are on the rise. And so going back to those first four scrolls that had been sold to Samuel, he decides that maybe it would be safer if he figured out a way to get the scrolls out of Israel. And so he ends up smuggling them to a church in New Jersey. They just sit there. They're just quiet. And then this cracks me up. In 1954, I don't know the reason why, but the archbishop placed an ad in the Wall Street Journal. It said this, the four Dead Sea Scrolls, biblical manuscripts dating back to at least 200 BC are for sale. This would be an ideal gift to an educational or religious institution by an individual or group. Luckily, (laughs) Yigal Yadin, so the son of the man who had bought the other three scrolls, he gets wind of this and ends up buying those four scrolls at that point on behalf of the state of Israel. That is how the initial seven scrolls came to be possessed by Israel. And then for the next nine years or so, archaeologists and treasure hunters and everybody who kind of gets wind of what is going on heads up into the caves of Qumran looking for more scrolls. 
sadly, the vast majority of the manuscript treasury ends up being taken by the Bedouin group. And the result is that academics and the people who really want to take these for posterity and learn from them, they end up having to buy them. I mean, they practically have to ransom the Dead Sea Scrolls to get them back from the Bedouin tribes. But after they have acquired as much as they possibly can, they have a collection that is a small number of almost complete scrolls. And then there are literally tens of thousands of scroll fragments. And they represent over 900 different texts. They're written in Hebrew. They're written in Aramaic, which was the common language, the common tongue at the time. And they're written in Greek. So this is an immense library. So now the logical question is, where did all of these scrolls come from? And why had they been so well hidden away? And it's such an immense library. How did it go unknown for almost 2,000 years? These are great questions. And to answer them, we need to go back to around 200 BCE again. Just like when we were talking about Masada last week. We are talking about a time of incredible political upheaval in the region. And we talked a lot about how the Jews were in frequent wars with first the Hellenistic governors who were over them and then eventually with Rome itself. That's a huge part of the story. But at the same time, all of the Jews, they weren't just a monolithic body. They weren't all in agreement with each other fighting together against Rome. There were very distinct factions. And in the New Testament, we do hear about two of those, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But there were a lot more groups than just those two. And one of the more major groups was a group of men called the Essenes. According to some historians, one of whom is Josephus, and I know we talked a little bit last week about how maybe he is not the most reliable narrator in the world. That goes for his stories of Qumran as well. But Josephus was one of them. Philo was another. There are writings from the time period telling us about the Essenes. According to some of these historians, the Essenes developed basically out of a sense of disgust with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Most scholars today will agree, not all but most, that the Essenes were the people who were living in Qumran and creating the Dead Sea Scrolls. And if it wasn't the Essenes exactly, then it was a monastic sect who shared a lot in common with the Essenes. And we can tell that based on the way that they lived, what's come out of the ground archaeologically, and then also based on the writings that they left behind and that are part of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this group, we're going to call them the Essenes to make it easy, they arrived at this place in Qumran in the 2nd century BCE. They set up a life there, and in 31 BCE, there was an earthquake that pushed them out for about 25 years or so, and then right around the time of Jesus' birth, they returned and picked up where they left off. And they stayed there then until 68 CE when the Romans came in and pushed them out. And you may remember from last week that during the Jewish wars, the Romans were going around and I mean, taking cities back. And so the Essenes lost Qumran in 68 CE. After that, the Roman garrison sort of set up shop there, just a couple of guys in the area. They hung out there for about 50 years until they abandoned it. And once that happened, the place was completely forgotten until 1947. The community at Qumran was what is called an ascetic sect, which basically means that they were really concerned with ritual purity. When you go to visit, this is apparent immediately. You start walking around the site and there's no water on the site now, but everything is marked. And what I was particularly struck by was the number of ritual baths that were in the area. The whole community had been built and formed around these irrigation channels that they had built, much the way Herod had provided irrigation to Masada. These monks had done the same thing for themselves in the Valley of Qumran. They built these irrigation channels, which were for cooking and bathing and having animals and for all sorts of reasons. But... There were an incredible number of ritual baths. They're called mikvahs or mikvahot is the proper way of making that plural. But there just seemed to be a super high concentration of baths, considering how small the site really is. That struck me right off the bat. 
And then you start paying attention and you realize that here in this low desert community, first off, there don't seem to be any houses. And I learned that the Essenes who were there at Qumran, or actually most Essenes, actually lived in tents or they would live in temporary housing that would be set up around the perimeter of their own little city. And so within the city, though, they were completely self-sufficient. You have assembly halls, multiple dining areas, some for just everyday dining and other halls that were set up for you know, ritual occasions. There's a kitchen. There's a laundry room. I mean, I, David and I lived in apartments early on that didn't even have a laundry room. But yeah, there's laundry facilities. There's a watchtower so that they can hopefully keep themselves safe. There's a stable. There's even a place that is dedicated to the making of pottery. So these guys set up so that they didn't need the outside world necessarily. What is unique to this place and what is probably the most exciting thing to take a look at is a room that is called the Scriptorium. This was at the very center of their little city, and it is just a writing room. And when it was excavated, they found in the writing room desks and inkstands. And it is assumed that in this place, that's where the men would sit for hours and hours writing scrolls or copying scrolls, the very scrolls that they then took and put in these large pottery containers and hid up in the caves. What they were producing, a lot of the scrolls were works that were unique to the Essene community. They explained how the Essenes interpreted the Hebrew Bible themselves, and they interpreted it a little bit differently from all other groups. I mean, I think that's common. Look at really any religion or you know, Christianity. Consider how many denominations we have. And that is because all of us hold the Bible up as sacred literature, but all of us read it a little differently and see some different things in it. Luckily, within the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have the writings of the Essene community so we can learn what exactly they were thinking and why they pulled away from the cities and why they really disliked the Pharisees and the Sadducees and other groups. We actually have the writings there. The fact is, they thought that the city of Jerusalem and the temple had been tainted, not just by foreign powers coming in and in some cases literally desecrating the temple, but actually by the Jews themselves. And they saw the Jewish faith as essentially unredeemable, and they basically just pulled out. What was the most important to them was purity. And so they couldn't be in a city. They couldn't be around people that they saw as worshiping God incorrectly or misinterpreting their scriptures. That's why they pulled away to these remote areas. We see in Qumran one example of this, but there were actually a scene communities all over the region. And they would keep in loose connection with one another. The Essenes were known to enjoy travel and communicating with each other. Just, you know, not getting together for a nightlife in the big city. <laughs> that wasn't really their thing. Instead, taking ritual baths all the time. One thing that was really important to them was staying celibate. In fact, women probably weren't even part of the Essene community or especially this one. They were very picky about their diets. They wanted to make sure that they were keeping kosher and not putting anything in their bodies that wasn't absolutely approved by God. And probably the most distinctive thing about them is they believed that if they, as members of this sect, remained ritually pure, did everything absolutely perfectly, that they would receive divine knowledge themselves that would tell them more about Hebrew scripture, help them to understand it better, help them to understand God better. Some scholars who specialize in the development of religions, how different denominations and sects or even religions as a whole came to be, like to point out that there seem to be a lot of parallels between the Essene community and Christianity. Some will go so far as to hypothesize that John the Baptist was actually himself an Essene. You can kind of see where they're coming from because first century Christianity, you see, especially with John the Baptist, this emphasis on having ritual bathing, which of course we would call baptism, having ritual bathing in not just a mikvah, but actually in moving waters. The Essenes believed that bathing in moving waters was even more cleansing than in still waters. So you see ritual bathing being important. You see this emphasis that's placed on special meals. Looking at the Gospels, of course, there's the Last Supper. But so often Jesus is described as sitting down with people to discuss the scriptures. 
And often there are stories of his feet being washed before that happens. That's something else that sort of resembles what the Essenes were doing at the time. And then later, when you're looking at the later letters of the New Testament and the early apostle age of Christianity, all the apostles were writing letters. And one thing that was important to them was to kind of connect these disparate communities through their travels. Of course, Paul going to different locations. Paul, the tent maker, going and speaking in different places and trying to develop continuity between the different groups of Christians that were out there. So there there are some parallels. That's a fair thing to say. Although, of course, a major difference (laughs) is the Essenes probably would have looked at Jesus and said, here is a man who is incredibly pure and the spirit has given him this extra insight, this gnosis, this divine knowledge. And Christians would say, well, no, he wasn't just a really great, pure guy. He actually was God. (laughs) And the words that he spoke weren't just divinely inspired. They actually were divine. So there's a huge break there with the Essenes. And then also, so many of the early churches, they weren't pulling themselves out of society and creating these communes off in the desert or up in the mountains or away from everybody else. You see in Ephesians and Romans and a lot of the what we might call plant churches today, they were in the cities. And that and the Great Commission and the spreading of Christianity to people who were anything but ritually pure is absolutely central to the initial tenets of Christianity. And it, of course, continues to be that way today. Okay, so here we are. It's the 1950s. The Israel Antiquities Authority has cobbled together all of the different bits of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They have developed a group of scholars who are going to come together and In some places, they are literally going to put the fragments together. But overall, they're going to need to look at these documents, study them, translate them, and give that knowledge and information out to the rest of the world. This is so exciting. Here, finally, we have texts of the Old Testament that were put down on parchment before Jesus was born. This is huge. And so everyone just waits. Everyone just waits for these scholars to get together and publish. 40 years go by, and in the meantime, this little magazine gets developed. If you are a fan of biblical archaeology the way that I am, then you have probably heard of Biblical Archaeology Review. It is, it's a beautiful magazine. It's full color. It's written in a popular style. Some people really, really love it, and some people really, really don't. Historically, it has given archaeologists and scholars a place to publish their findings, tell people about their work, do it quickly, and to get it out to the masses. That's something that's really, really great about it. These people don't have to wait for their work to be peer-reviewed. That is also the flip side, is a lot of people get frustrated with the magazine because archaeologists and scholars are putting work out there into the world that hasn't been peer-reviewed. And so maybe sometimes things are published that months or years or decades later end up needing to be retracted because maybe the material didn't have due diligence before it was put out into print. So I happen to love it. I love it for what it is. And I love it for the way that it makes archaeology accessible to absolutely everyone without the reader needing to know a lot of academic jargon most of the time. Biblical Archaeology Review looks and reads the way that it does today, largely because of its founder, I think. Um, It was a gentleman named Herschel Shanks. He was not an archaeologist. He was an individual who just loved biblical archaeology. He'd been publishing this magazine for many, many years. He was sitting in his office one day, like the rest of the world, strumming his fingers, waiting, going, when are we going to get to read something about the Dead Sea Scrolls? When are we going to get to see images of it? When am I, as a publisher, going to be able to print something in my magazine about this? And the frustration just built for him. Late 1980s, early 1990s, barely a dozen people throughout all of that time all over the world had ever had the opportunity to lay their eyes on the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Herschel Shanks, he took matters into his own hands and he picked up the phone and called a Ph.D. student who had been working with the scrolls. And he somehow convinced this guy to commit what most people would have assumed would be academic and professional suicide. 
and give him the preliminary findings of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Herschel Shanks then took these and he turned around and he published them in what we might call today a bootleg copy. He took another step. He went even further and he got photographs of the scrolls, unofficial photographs, and he actually printed those as well. And that sort of broke the seal. From that point on, the Dead Sea Scrolls were out there. They were in the world and scholars anywhere could look at them and read them and study, maybe not the literal physical thing, but they could study images of them and come to their own conclusions. He ended up getting sued, not surprisingly, and he was convicted of copyright infringement and had to pay $40,000 for what he did. But Herschel Shanks wrote about this himself. And he and many others have said that, honestly, $40,000 was not a whole lot to pay after 40 years of waiting for something that was so incredibly important to academia, to history, to archaeology specifically, to lovers of the Bible, you know, the Old Testament, to sociologists everywhere, that this was so huge. It needed, something needed to happen. And he made that happen in maybe not the most legitimate of ways. So he tends to get credit for being the one who got the Dead Sea Scrolls out to us. I think that's largely fair. But round about the same time, and maybe it was because of Herschel Shanks and the rumblings that he was going to do something, or maybe not, maybe it was unrelated. But at the same time, the Israel Antiquities Authority, they lifted a lot of their restrictions on access to the scrolls themselves so that other scholars could come in and take a look at them and study them. And a foundation was born at the same time for the development of scholarship around the Dead Sea Scrolls. Leadership changed. All of this happened within a few years of Herschel Shanks sort of going rogue and publishing the Dead Sea Scrolls when he really had no right to do that. The entire story of how the Dead Sea Scrolls got out into the world is really great. And if you look at the notes to this podcast, I have put a link there to a much longer article that describes all of this. And I feel like I need to admit that maybe I'm a little biased in my respect for Herschel Shanks. Every time I see him, I think of my husband's late grandfather. I just I think he looks so much like the late Papa Haley. And that just, I don't know, it gives me warm fuzzies every time I, I think about either one of them. Ultimately, I respect Herschel Shanks for the work that he did in making biblical archaeology accessible to the masses. I wish I had had the opportunity to meet him, but unfortunately, he passed away exactly five weeks ago today at the age of 90. But what an incredible legacy he left behind. If you enjoyed this episode of The Red-Haired Archaeologist, then I hope you will listen again soon. New episodes are released each Friday. To learn more about me, check out my website, redhairedarchaeologist.com. There you will find links to my books, this podcast, and my blog, where you can interact with me and other listeners. Also look for my new book, The Red-Haired Archaeologist Digs Israel. It is available now as a print book, ebook, and audiobook from all of your favorite retailers.